Hello, hello, and welcome back to yet another episode of Minority Minority Reports. I'm your host, Mona Schick. How is everyone doing on this Friday? I am uh, very looking, much looking forward to a weekend where I just get to sleep in a little bit more, although I'm not going to because I always have stuff that I'm uh, lining up uh, to do on the weekend. So hopefully I will get some sleep in. How are you guys doing? What are you guys going to be doing this weekend? I'm very excited. Today we have a very, very special guest. Um, I have uh, admired her for a very long time and I actually am in a little bit of a shock that she was so sweet and hum- humble and kind to accept my invitation and I'm very excited to have her. Uh, I mean, she's an OG. Uh, what can I say? Uh, you've seen her on Conan. She, she's been uh, on the Winnipeg Comedy Festival. She's been, she's an OG, okay? Uh, the very funny Jackie Cash. Jackie, how are you doing, my friend? I'm good. I'm great. I am not in the middle of the camera. Hi. What? Uh, hi. Hey, oh, there you are. There yeah, you are. I am. You are the center of attention, Jack. I, 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 you know what? I had uh, the thing up higher. It's a great story. I'm not going to tell it anymore because it. Uh, I got bored of the story uh, in the middle of it. Good afternoon, Mona. Where are <laughs> you? Are you in Canada? Oh, Jesus. No, I'm in LA. Oh, okay. I was like, because I thought you said something about Canada. I was like, oh, is she yeah. lucky enough to not live in our dumpster fire? Good for her. <laughs> Good for her. No, you know, I, if I did live in Canada, I think this would be the one time I would be like, I live in Canada. <laughs> Right. Uh, I think this is the only one time when Canadians are like, we're hot. Like we got to go. Yeah. Out. We're, we're the ones you're going to want to talk to. Right. So, yeah. Oh so oh how, how are you, well, I was asking you before the show, so how are you kind of holding up during the pandemic? Are you, you know, how are you kind of keeping your sanity? Well, I, you know, I am, uh, here's the interesting thing that I was just thinking about is that this is the first time probably in, 20 odd years that I've been home this month. I've, I've been home since March 15th. So, what? and um, that's almost what, five months or something like that. I've never been home that long. And luckily, you know, cause I, I am, I guess I'm both a social person and a, and a, and a little homebody because I'm doing just fine, but I also, I'm married. So, and I like him a great deal. So we're having, uh, we're getting to, we're, we're, uh, what's the longest we've ever spent together. So it's been a delight. Is it, is it like, because now you're spending so much time home, are you like getting like reacquainted in some sense? We did, you know, when I would come home off the road, if I, if I, you know, if I was some years, I would spend so much time on the road that when I did come home, it was some sort of, there was a readjustment, you know, where I'm, Oh, you're here the whole time. Okay. Uh, I need this area. You need to not talk to me because I'm on my computer. And, uh, you know, so it was there, there is always some sort of adjustment right when I get off the road. But, and so now, the good news is, is that um, we're pretty much used to it now, you know, and so, yeah. so not now we've now we've socially arrived. We're fine. How long have you been married for, Jackie? Well, we have been married since two thousand six, Andy and I, and uh, so that is fourteen. It'll be fourteen years, um, which is great. And then we were together for we met three years prior to that. Wow. So in Los Angeles, that's considered 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. I said, we're, we're, uh, there were some sort of weird epic. Uh, it was amazing. Um, as my sister said, you know, if you're going to wait 17 years for a boyfriend, that's the guy to wait for. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's a delight. Uh, the thing about Andy Aww. Ashcraft is that he is enormously sane and an adult man. That's- which, yeah. Wait. Did you, where did you go? Where did, where did you find this, 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 this unicorn? Where did you find this unicorn? Exactly. He feels like a unicorn uh, when you're surrounded by, and the thing is, is it's not that there aren't decent men in stand-up comedy. They don't get any press, uh, yeah. but uh, there, uh, there are plenty of them and it's, um, but he is, he doesn't do stand-up. He makes video games for a living and um, he is from California originally. He has, He's very much a social, he has 40 close friends that aren't me. Wow. So, I mean, he has his own, I mean, it's, but it was very important to me that I didn't know how important it was yeah. that he have his own life. Yes. And that he have something to do. Yes. That, that wasn't, 
you know, like he needed me to have that too. You know, we don't, when in, in, in real life, we just, we don't sit in each other's pockets too much, but he, I have never been with anybody who I can just hang out with silently as much as I can with him where there's nothing to do. You know, one thing I always hear about couples uh, who have been together for more than 10 years and are happy, right? One thing is to be together with someone, but, but it's not <laughs> to be happy with that. Person, right? <laughs> which which uh-huh. seems to be the case for you. Uh, yeah. And one of the key things that they always say to me is just like, if you guys can sit together in a room silently and still know what's going on, that that tells you the quality of that great relationship. Right. I mean, I mean, there's nothing I like more than just sort of, I mean, we don't have the TV on too much. And for a long time I was like, Oh, he doesn't like television. And then I realized he is on a YouTube rabbit hole. He's watching tele. It's essentially he's watching television without me. Exactly. And, uh, and that's fine. I'm in my own internet rabbit hole. Right. And then eventually I wander off and go read uh, an excellent to not excellent, uh, the whole spectrum, uh, book, a little fiction. I'll read, uh, almost anything is what I'm saying. Oh, really? That's I'll amazing. Off. Yeah. Do, you, do, do you mostly read fiction or fiction or do you read autobiography? No, no, almost exclusively fiction. Oh, really? I, I like it. Yeah. Uh, and the, the fascination now with memoirs and nonfiction that, I mean, and, and memoirs, I, in my opinion, count. Those are nonfiction. Yeah. They've been, I'm sure, polished up real nice. Uh, <laughs> if I were to write a memoir, which is what yeah. most of my act is, yeah. uh, it has been polished. So <laughs> now, Jackie, you've been doing, I mean, you're an OG. You've been doing comedy for how many years now? Uh, well, I started, uh, I count the 80s kind of as one year. Uh, because I started in 84, the whole decade, yeah, I started in 84, but I, it was, it was an intense 80, 1984, 1985, like one and a half. There was a year that was very intense. And then there was five years that was very hit and miss because I had to graduate from college. So, um, so that's why I sort of count. I mean, that first year I did stand up every night for eight. Wow. And I got a 1.8 that semester. Things had to, you had to regroup. Sure. Uh, I was alerted by my sister, who it turns out is the boss of me, uh, <laughs> that I needed to graduate. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 where did you go to school and what were you going to school for? Uh, University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, so I went uh, to uh, UW Madison and then, um, and I ended up majoring in poli sci. I was like three or four years in. Yeah. I was probably three years in when they said, you have to pick a major. And I said, oh. well, what does it look like? <laughs> and they said, you have one more credit toward graduation in political science than you do in ancient history. And I was like, huh, I'm a poli sci major, it turns out. Thank you very much. Uh, but you never pursued it, though. No, no. At the... Um, Essentially, I just, I took classes uh, that, that, you know, the eighties were sort of a, it was, it was kind of a heyday of, of higher education in the United States where you could get Pell Grants. It was before, it was right as Ronald Reagan was ruining the higher education, uh, Pell Grants and loans and all that stuff became much more uh, pejorative and, and, and impossible. So, um, I could, I had more money than I had ever had in my whole life, uh, with loans and grants. And I took classes that I was interested in. And then, um, I was mostly just interested, you know, I come from a large family and, um, everybody, it's interesting to, I think about it now and everyone in my family is, they're really very smart. Um, and when I, and I'm the youngest. And so there was constantly a lot of chatter about what we should all be believing in politically, what we should all be believing in financially. You know, there was a lot of financial advice, a lot of political advice, a lot, a lot of advice. I have four older brothers and an older sister. Wow. So, yeah. I have four older brothers too. Oh, do you? Yeah. And I'm the youngest and the only girl. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Luckily, my sister had me. Uh, (laughs) Well, when you've already established, she's the boss of you. Yeah. Well, it's so funny because uh, there's a very funny story about my grandmother who uh, said, because it goes four boys, my sister, and then me. And she, Darla told me that uh, our grandmother once said to her, 
you know, it was so nice when you were born because then there was someone to take care of the boys. And <laughs> wow. My sister said, yeah, you're thinking of someone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the case, isn't it? You know, that's so funny you said that. Uh, when I, uh, I moved, so I was born and partially raised in Pakistan. Uh, and I moved at 15 to uh, Jersey City in New Jersey. Oh, my God. And my four wow. old brothers lived there. My parents always lived in Pakistan. My brother- Are you secretly Ms. Marvel? Are you Kamala <laughs> I would Khan? love to be Ms. Marvel. Are you kidding me? You should totally be Ms. Marvel. I would should totally. Ms. Marvel's story is my childhood. I should she's, do not. She's in Jersey. She's, yeah. And, she's uh, Danny. She's in Jersey City. City. In Jersey City. Could you get any more specific? No, no, it's literally plucked from your life. Exactly. Um, exactly. She has siblings. You have more siblings, but yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, my when I moved out here, my mom primarily like primed me and prepared me to cook and clean for my brothers. Like that's what I was trained to do. You know, yep. I was expected to take care of my brothers, and I'm the youngest. Right, right. So even more of that. So because you want to also be of some use, right? And yeah. and and there's, you know, and the thing is, is I don't regret being taught to be of some use. Yeah. Uh, because it feels more helpful globally. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but I, you know, my oldest brother was not taught to be of any use, and uh, sometimes that's exhausting. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yes, and you're yeah. just like, hey, uh, why don't you rise to the occasion, my friend? <laughs> why and, you, uh, um, make put yourself to work, maybe a little. Right, bit. right. Why don't you? <laughs> Did he marry a woman who also just caters to him and takes care of him for thirty five years, and then she divorced him? And uh, I was like, good for you, Susie. Run, run like the wind, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> That says a lot, Jackie, when you're on the side of the sister-in-law, not the brother. Right. My brother, my oldest brother, uh, she is, uh, my sister-in-law, a lovely woman. She is, uh, her family is Mexican, though I think the, her family has been in this country longer than mine. Wow. So, uh, so, but they're from Arizona, Tucson. And um, so my, they have four kids and she, you know, they they had, they have that whole thing where girls... It's what? just the put to work girl business. And, you know, and there's, and like I said, I don't have a problem being that person. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel I get some sense of self from being someone who can be that helper. You know, right. like I, I do a joke about how I live my life punched in thinking that if I don't do all the side work, I'm going to lose shifts. <laughs> and, uh, but the, the, the thing is, is, is it's not, it gets, it, it can get taken advantage of, obviously. And, right. and it's something that just perpetuates a level of sexism that I didn't know existed because I never thought of it like that. Right. 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 Did you grow up because you grew up with brothers? Did you grow up as a tomboy? Yeah. And the lucky thing about, about having like my, my dad and my, my stepmother, there was very little, there wasn't sexism per se. The sexism that we experienced was in the Armenian church. And, and it was literally just be like the man in the nice picture and go get your dad some coffee. Mm. There was a lot of, you know, your dad's going to want a plate of food. You should probably dash off and get that for him. And that was the extent of it. And then with my father, mm. he treated all six of us with the same sort of casual disregard he was uh as i like to say my father's a lot like radiation we never saw him but he affected all of our lives <laughs> uh, i would say that is that is probably one of the greatest examples of her i would say that is uh that is like a lot of ethnic parents actually they're like radiation right right because they're not they're, they're just like no you when he was around, he, he was a very powerful figure and he, and it made a difference, right? It made a difference to how you acted. It made a difference about how, which, how you reacted, but he wasn't around. Like he was working um, right. or hanging out, having some coffee. That guy, that yeah. guy likes to go have coffee with people. Right. And, uh, <laughs> there's no, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, Hey son, uh, tell me how your day was or, Hey, what grade are you in? And how's your what's your favorite subject? Like, 
My yeah. favorite stories are of, you know, we would, when, when he, he remarried almost immediately after my mother passed. And uh, so, cause my, well, you're done when you passed away? Yeah, she was, I was seven and my oldest wow. brother was 17. Wow. And so uh, my father and my, st- and my parents had been separated. So he had been dating this woman who hilariously did not know that he had six children. Uh, he never mentioned it. They'd been going out for about two years and he never mentioned that he had six kids. kids. <laughs> and my step, Nancy was like, and he was always like, I told you. And I'm like, no, I would have remembered. Now this is one of those things. Yeah. It's not just one. It's two kids. <laughs> like, and he knew and she knew that he had at least one, but he didn't, she didn't know he had six. And then, <laughs> and then here's wow. where, here's where, you know, she married him after she found out. So this, this is on her, right? So, but she was an Armenian lady too. No, she was, uh, my, my biological mother was Irish. Uh, oh, okay. and so, and my stepmother was, uh, came from Italian Polish stock. Okay. So very Wisconsin sort of super whitey Magoo, you know, Wisconsinite ladies that he got into. And, um, but the, but she was figuratively. So. Oh my God. So into six kids anyway. So, uh, but Nancy, Nancy was great. Cause she just, um, there was charts, graphs. She was a great loss to the Austrian army. And, uh, but she insisted that we have dinner together. She was like, if I'm going to raise these kids, you're helping. You have to be at dinner. And so we would all sit at dinner and then my dad would do this thing where he would ask us how our days were. And it was like open mic. You had like a minute and a half to get his attention. <laughs> it, was it was excellent you training. They're scribbling your jokes. You're like, ah, I think that the tag is not oh, good. Is he going to care about homeroom or is he going to want to hear about civics? What's <laughs> this is a good premise today to talk to dad about. What is this? Oh, man. Uh, exactly. Not a love trauma, Jackie. That's where it all comes from. Right. And, and if you think about somebody did some joke the other day, they said, you know, people are always saying how resilient children are and sure they're resilient, but if they're so resilient, why are we all talking about our childhoods for the rest of our lives? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think that was Ophira Eisenberg actually. So <laughs> yeah. uh, you know her from NPR anyway, she's a uh, New York comic. Okay. She's very funny. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I, um, I'm always, um, I always like to hear, uh, especially when I talk to comics, uh, exactly stories like you just mentioned, right? Like, I mean, was she a nice lady to you? She was, I mean, here's the thing about Nancy Cation. She never wanted children. And she used to tell us that. And she was like, I never wanted children, but we're doing this now. So, uh, when it's over, we will love each other and we won't know why. And, um, so yes. So she was, you know, the thing is that she was to some extent driven mad by this thing. She loved my dad. She loved my dad so much and wanted to be with him so much. And he can be one of the most casually thoughtless people on the planet. Mm. The Mm. apple does not fall that far from the tree sometimes with any of us. Uh, but he is, he is not particularly one of my favorite stories about, uh, probably 10, 11 years ago now, I was out to lunch with him and he said that he had talked to my sister and I said, she took your call. (laughs) And he said, is she mad at me? And I said, well, you know, they had another kid and you never mentioned it. And he goes, well, does she know that I don't care about any of your kids? And I said, do you know that I don't have any kids? Uh, he goes, mm, interesting. Anyway, so. And is he like that with your brothers too or just towards the girls? Oh, entirely with my brothers as well. Yeah. Like, wow. so yeah, he doesn't. That. That's his vibe. That's just. That, who he it's complete. He is. I don't believe he has not even ever met his great grandchildren. So, uh, he he just he likes he doesn't mind when he when he sees them he's very happy, uh, but he is not going to go out of his way. Out he of hopes side, it all works out. Out of sight, out of mind. That's how. He yes, is. and so, but I will say that one of the good things that that did was yeah. that it made it um, 
I, for some reason, am very fidgety. Sorry. You seem to be holding very steady, very professional. I'm You're I'm great. Usually I'm horrible. Very fidgety. I'm just like, what? Anyway, so, but I, uh, I will say this, though, about my dad, is that he was equally attentive and inattentive Mm. to all six of us uh my brother russ put more effort into his relationship with my dad so they have had a relationship for 35 years that is very very beautiful and uh epic right uh he is the youngest of the boys yeah okay he's a young wow wow yeah i i had a very uh tumultuous relationship with my father like a very tumultuous one uh Mainly because my father was very physically abusive towards me, towards my mother. So Ooh. that, yeah, so that was like really rough. So I never kind of, you know, I, it took me a long time to try to make peace with him. Uh, and uh, by the time I made peace with him, literally, I should you not, I made peace with him and a month later he died. <laughs> like that's how it happened. Well, universe clearly waiting for you to go. This can't possibly follow me forever. I got to <laughs> let it go. Let me let it go. And then oddly enough, he can also keep going. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, dads are, it's interesting, you know, I, I don't know how, I don't know how, how that, your relationship with your father, how did that, did do you think it played a role in the kind of men you dated or the kind of man you're married to? Like, did that, do you think it had an effect on you? I think probably. I mean, the weird thing is, is, is my mother who passed away when I was little, she was actually very physical with us uh, in that in a positive way. Uh, and uh, to my knowledge, she beat him up too. And uh, my dad. So it was like one of the reasons he left. Or like punching him out. Yeah. Like punching and, and hurting. Like literally she was a, I have, and, and, Quite honestly, I've had to make peace with my mother, right? I mean, you have to sort of give it up. And you have to realize that parents are just people That's who right. happen to be the in charge of you without any sort of uh, experience. That's right. And so my mother, when they got married, she was like 16 or 17 years old. Yeah. And he was, I think she got pregnant when she was 15. He was wow. 17. They got married. He joined the Navy and was in the Marines because he was a medic and they just had lots of kids. And my father, as has already been established, wasn't around a bunch, but he would give his check to her yeah, and then weed off. And then she was like, I have 10, I have six children under the age of 10. And so to some extent she was driven mad. And so Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that's an excuse for the violence that I experienced, but I don't have, I genuinely don't have any positive memories of her. And so even as young as seven. Yeah. Even though I, even though I knew her until I was almost eight. So, um, and that's, but I am sympathetic to her experience and, you know, part of it is what, what my stepmother actually used to say, (laughs) she'd say, You know, sometimes uh, if you're born in the rain, that's super sad. But if you're 30 and you're still standing in the rain, get the fuck out of the rain. Mm. Uh, You're a grown-up person. Uh, Mm. Get an umbrella. Get out of the rain. You have to learn how to deal with it. And Mm. her child, my stepmother's childhood was was fraught with peril, you know? I mean, so there was... and But your grandmother must have... Was she born in America or was she born in Armenia? My grandmother... um, was born in Turkey and she was uh, wow. driven across Lebanon and Syria with the, in the, in the genocide by wow. the Turks. Wow. So wow. she, you know, in many ways, talk you know, she's been oh, shit, Jackie, talk about trauma. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. She didn't have a lot of patience for our trauma. Uh, she was just like, yeah, walk it off. And, um, <laughs> exactly. You got hit. I almost got killed. Walk it off. Right. I don't know if you are familiar. and But I mean, there are stories like there's a story on my last album that I have told easily a handful of times. And two of those times was when I recorded the album because it's emotionally. Yeah. It's kind of, you know, you want you want comedy to be funny. Yeah. And personal. And then when you're driven mad by the by society. Mm-hmm. You get weirdly political. Like I've never been a political comic. I'm a political person. I'm alive. I vote. Uh, the uh, 
But with the advent of, you know, Captain Knobjob, I don't know if you can hear I'm in a helicopter test area. Oh, no, uh, so, but the insanity of it is, is that there's a couple of tracks. The My last album was recorded six weeks after the election. Okay, wow. so I was still in shock. Mm-hmm. So that, that album has, I believe, 55 minutes. And the first 10 of it is the first ever full-on political ranting stand-up comedy that I've ever done in my whole life. Wow. And one of those stories was the story of my grandmother uh, being marched across Syria in the genocide. And her explaining it to me when I was a kid, because, you know, when you're a child yeah, and your parents or your grandparents have gone through something horrible, you're like, what was it like? <laughs> And they're like, hey, I've been spending 35 years trying to forget what it was like. Uh, You're 13 or you're nine or you're six and you're fascinated with death uh, or whatever age you are and you're a child. And I remember when I was 13, I was doing genealogy for for school, but uh, yeah, for school. And so I made her. I was like, tell me about your siblings and your parents. And I was like, well, where are all these people? And. I made her cry because she's like, they're dead, Jackie. They're dead. And I was like, Jesus Christ, I'm so sorry. And then because I'm 13 and I'm st- I'm an idiot, I'm like, what was it like? What was it like? <laughs> like? And she looked at, I remember, she just looked at me and she's like, okay. Uh, so there were probably, for every 200 Armenians, there was one Turkish soldier with a gun. And we were marched uh, past these villages in, uh, I believe it was Syria. And uh, so we're marched past these villages. And she said, uh, so for, there was one soldier with a gun. And I, and then she paused and she looked at me and I said, why didn't you just tackle him? There were more of you. Why didn't you just kill him? And he said, and she, and she looked at me and she's like, yeah, uh, none of us wanted to be the first to die. So we all died. Yeah. And you're like, what? And you're like, she said, and notice she said, we all died. Mm -hmm. She didn't die. Mm -hmm. But as far as, you know, a lot of her died right there. You know, survivor's guilt, all of that bullshit. Where, and I, and I, of course, think that she told me that story because she uh, would like me to uh, just die. Uh, When, when, uh, when they got, when there's, when there's a guy with a gun hurting somebody, just, uh, you've lived a good long life. You're fine. You're a middle-aged white lady now, Jackie. They're not going to kill you. You're fine. God You're- forbid, first of all, Jackie, God forbid, I, I pray that never, ever, ever comes at, at any of our ways. Uh, right. I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's a real, you know, craziness and tragedy, but that's a reality that we live in. But, you know, it's like when I hear stories like that, I, it just, it just, that story actually reminds me of my uh, story my grandmother used to tell me, but when India and Pakistan had the partition, Right. Yes. It was like what, like six million people were displaced, right? Which is right. an enormous amount of people. Uh, and my grandmother used to tell me the story that uh, when the trains from India would arrive into Pakistan, because, you know, our family was Muslim, so they had to pick up their stuff and move over and all that nonsense. And she would tell me that the trains would arrive and they would go to the train station to pick up their relatives. And every single person on the train would be dead, including babies. They would have, they slaughtered everyone. And vice versa, right? And by, and, and right. Then, these are like images that will just haunt you for the rest of your life. Right? Forever. Forever. And you're like, oh, and how old were you? Oh, I was 16. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, because you're 90 now. And exactly. that is still something that is so, it, you know, it's entirely in your head. Yep. And it's, it, it's. Um, I, I mean, to me, like their survival stories are uh, amazing. I, I think I think sometimes when, uh, I don't know if th- this happens with you, but sometimes I kind of get in like that kind of self-pity mode or like I'm standing in the rain uh, without the umbrella. <laughs> exactly. yeah. yeah, I'm standing in the rain without the umbrella and I'm just like, okay, first of all, they had it way worse than I did. So let's yes. get some fucking perspective here. Okay? Exactly. Right. And my the favorite thing about my grandmother is that she had only like three stories about the genocide and two of them were funny. You know, she was always just like... <laughs> <laughs> she's like if i'm going to be telling you stories about these things let me just tell you the funny ones I bet and, you had more than three. she just didn't want to go any further into it right well of course and uh right and the and the the two she would tell all the time was that when when the turks came into the into the village to roust everybody out they were given like 10 minutes to grab their stuff 
And uh, she used to say that they left bread in the oven and she would be like, I'm still worried about that bread. And uh, I'm like, I bet you'd burn. I bet you'd burn, Grandma. Oh my god! And uh, and then the the general in charge, he goes, he was a pretty good, he was a nice enough guy. The the Turkish general who was rousing us out of our homes said that we could bring our donkey. And my grand and she, my grandmother goes, my grandmother's grandmother was going to ride this donkey, but the village priest, the Armenian village priest, stole the donkey so they could ride it. And my grandmother, who was 15 or 16 at the time, took a two by four and beat the priest off of the donkey. Yeah, I know. it. I was like, that's a great story. I love that. That is a Shiro story is what it is. What are you? Wow. Yeah. Wow, Jackie, look at you. Come from a, a line of uh, warriors over here. Right, she was a badass, and uh, in, in, in the in the end, what I come from is a, li- uh, a line of survivors, yeah. which uh, I think is what we should all look forward. I mean, that's that's the that's the thing, because like, where we're at right now is we we just have to survive. You know, everybody who every person who says that these are the end times, I just want to go that attitude is yeah. bullshit yeah. <laughs> because first yeah. of all it isn't it never yeah. it it hasn't been before it isn't yeah. now and why would you live your life like that yeah. and uh and second of all uh shut up anyway you know, so- you know, I, I i look at um to me somebody was uh, asking me they're like what do you think is the most resilient thing in the world and i was like the human spirit i really believe that the human spirit is by far the most resilient thing that I've ever come across. I mean, even when ships sink, right? Those giant, giant ships, they go to the end of the bottom of the ocean and they corrode and they they pretty much just collapse, right? And then they're these massive things. But the human spirit isn't like that. I mean, you know, like the stories of your grandmother, the stories of my grandmother and what they go through. And they're just like, yep, still worried about that bread. Still worried about that bread. Exactly. And if you think about like the stories that we passed down, from from every generation to the next. You know, they're still talking about that guy, Homer. Remember that guy? Homer. Not Simpson. <laughs> uh, the, guy, the Greek guy. Anyway, so, I mean, they're still talking about the people that that had that have that human spirit so exactly. I, I i think and i think you know that's why human beings tell stories right it is the the stories are about human resilience like most of the time that's what it is uh and, and i feel like when people like your grandmother my grandmother people who survive and are survivors you know i i think in their head they also know that they have a choice either they're going to be a, an example or they're uh, you know either going to be or either going to be an example of like don't live your life like that or they're going to be uh, an inspiration. And I, right. I, think, I think there's something that goes in their head when they're just like, what am I going to be? What am I going to be? Am I going to be yeah. an example that I'm just going to fall down and collapse and self-pity myself? And there are those people too. Or am I going to just pick myself up and be an inspiration? Right. And we all go through periods of self-pity and all periods sure. of... What some, guy, some guy told me the other day that uh, one of his best friends now, when they first met, uh, said... Hey, hey, slow down, man. Nobody's going to take away your anger. You just, you, you're good. You got, you can keep that as long as you want. Anyway, uh, let's go get sandwiches or whatever. I mean, like, he was just like, yeah. it was, it's that perspective. Yeah. I feel like, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I've suffered with anger and like rage issues for a very long time. I've been in therapy for like 13 years now. Uh, I'm the first member in my family ever to even go to therapy and to even right. openly talk about it, mainly because in our culture, there's such a stigma. Uh, and I'm not talking right. about the American culture. I'm talking about the South Asian culture or even the Muslim right. culture. There's just so much stigma about it. Uh, did you like... I mean, it's you grew up in a mixed family. You grew up, you know, your mom was Irish, your dad was Ar- Armenian. Was that something like? Did you grow up with any kind of Armenian traditions that way, or that wasn't a thing for you? Entirely Armenian. It was. Uh, we we grew up in the church, and um, and so the Armenian thing was was much more hammered into us than the Irish thing, and um, and it was. In some cases, it was because my mother passed away when when I was so little. But my dad, you know, it, it was just a, a bigger deal. So um, yeah, and all of uh, like my 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 brother Russ, the golden child, to this day, he's like the you know he's the grand poobah of his church, and uh, you know, and his kids are very you know into the church and stuff, and they're deacons or altar they were altar boys and now they're deacons and yeah, so yeah, the Arme- the Armenian thing. But then I moved to Los Angeles mm. 
where there's Armenians, you know, I mean, I'm Wisconsin Armenian and uh, <laughs> these people are like, and, and my father was born in this country. And, and so um, there's been some melting we've, we've melted people. And uh, so I can do food and I can do church. I can't speak Armenian. Right. Um, and if you want me to hate Azerbaijan, it's not happening. It's not <laughs> happening. So, uh, well, that's always a thing, right? That's always a thing that you're just kind of, you know, it's interestingly enough, uh, with, with, with our family, uh, we were, my dad, which is very surprising, would wake us up on like Sunday mornings. Uh, and he had an antenna in a very strange place that he would place outside the window where it would catch this Indian channel coming through where they would tell the stories of the Hindu gods, right? And oh, okay. for us, like as Muslims, we were taught that it was sacrilege and you're not supposed to, but my dad was fascinated by it. And my dad wanted to instill that in us too, where there was like no hating of Hindus. It's like, be fascinated by things, open your mind and learn things. And it was very, it was very, very, very progressive of him. Uh, right. Like, hey, you should learn about the Hindu gods and like waking us up to be like, you should guys should come and watch the TV and watch these amazing Hindu god stories, you know. Right. For our right. Family. And of course, it was like on the hush hush. Nobody in the family was told that we were going to do that. Otherwise, it was going right. to be like oh, the sacrilege thing. But what kind of what kind what kind of a thing uh, is I, I'm sure because of the Turk, gen, you know, and the the Turkish uh, that they committed the genocide um, uh, uh, against the Armenians, which which is very a lot alarming to me that's to this day <laughs> Turks like deny it they're like we didn't do it we didn't do it right like, right and it's I mean literally it. take that's why I always think you know it's it's kind of it's it's one of the reasons why there's this redemption of the Germans is yeah. because they can admit the worst thing that they ever did that's right. That's why I think they're going to be the heroes in World War Three. It's going to be very exciting, <laughs> and for them, good for them. And uh, oh, oh God, it's already begun. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they're cool. vindicated. <laughs> they're vindicated because if you admit the worst thing you ever did, you can heal from it, right? right. It's. Right. I have a friend who has since passed away, who you know went through this you know therapy and all of this this self seeking to sort of let go of just sort of the, the, the terrible things that are sometimes done to us mm -hmm. and which lead us to then do terrible things to other people sometimes. Right. Um, and she was talking about how, if she told four people the worst thing that she ever did in her life, uh, it no longer, it didn't matter anymore because it pulled, it pulled the thorn out. It took the sting out of it and people could be shocked, but she's like, so what I'm doing is I'm making sort of, uh, I'm not doing that anymore, you know. Um, I like it. I, I, you know what it is? It's the. Uh, have you heard of Brene Brown? Brene Brown. Do you know who she is? I've heard that name. I don't know anyone though. She's so, brilliant. Yeah. She's okay. She's a brilliant, brilliant writer, and she has a book called uh, "Dare to Lead," uh, and in it, she talks about shame extensively. Uh, okay. And in different forms that it comes in, you know, at, at work and at home and, oh, I, you know, I, I'm ashamed of this. And, and, and she talked about the power of shame. And I feel like um, it just like as in, in an individual uh, is the same applies to in a country. If you can't ex if you can't accept a problem, you can't correct it. Right. Right. And, right. and I think that is a, that, I mean, that's a huge thing when, whenever I hear, you know, look, I have Turkish friends, you know, I have Armenian friends. And, you know, when I hear uh, Turkish people, uh, you know, are from the Turkish side say that the genocide never happened. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? It's because, and, and the thing is, is the Turks that I meet, the, the government has denied it and educated people so thoroughly that when I meet young, young Turks, uh, Turkish people that are young, not, not the young Turks, uh, the, uh, uh, which is an online program that I, is an online program that they decided to, without thinking, they named themselves after the perpetrators of the genocide. You might want to rename yourself Washington Redskins. Anyway, uh, so, but the, the thing is, is when I meet those, the, those young men and women, uh, I am like, no, I understand that you were yeah. lied to, but yeah. so was I right. about the native Americans. That's right. So was I about, uh, about all people of color in this country. Right. And the right. thing is, is sometimes 
you know, the worst is when I think I know, you know, it's like, oh, I get it. You know, I've been a hippie, skippy crystal clutcher since the 80s. You know, uh, I used to say Nicaragua. I've been insufferable for decades. <laughs> oh, my so. God, my dear friends are Nicaraguan and they're like, it's Nicaragua. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> Nicaragua. right. And you're just like, well, you know, so you think that you get it and then. And then you get it like another layer of the onion is, is peeled back. You yeah. know, when the iPhone camera was invented and then all of a sudden every day, there's some fresh new horror that I, that is being revealed to me. I'm like, what the, I thought I got racism. And then I'm like, nope, nope. Yeah. You've got like a veneer of, you know, like there's this whole, cause the, the, one of the problems for white people and I, and I'm speaking to my fellow whitey magoos, um, is that that when I was a kid, we were taught that racism was if you hated someone for their the color of their skin. Mm-hmm. And that is not, that's sure, that is step one. Uh, but racism is literally all of it. Right. Just, you're not, like, like, the newest, my newest layer is that I have to meet every single person like they're a stalk of meat with a brain, right? Everybody's got a different sausage casing. Yeah, Which, of course, should not lend itself to cannibalism, but like literally meet the meet the meat, meet the meat person standing in front of you with a brain. Right. Don't look at it and go, oh, I would like to fuck that guy uh, <laughs> or I would never fuck that guy. I mean, that's a terrible <laughs> that's a weird way to meet somebody. Just meet that- the. Yeah, I, I, those those thoughts only go through my head when I say I don't want to fuck that guy is when I'm around, around comedians, male comics. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually the thoughts that go through. Aww, my poor comedians. Poor they comics. just want to get laid. Uh, and, uh, boo. That's why. That's my theory. Why a lot of male com- that That's not my theory. It's Lori's theory. Lori Kilmartin has a theory that a lot of male comics aren't doing stand up because they can't get laid. Yes, and, I and they're, that. they're not. They're not doing online shows because they're like, what's in it for me? No, exactly. no one's going to touch my, my metal bits. Exactly. <laughs> my metal bits. I mean, you know, if there's, there's only so much pandemic masturbation you can go through. And then like, <laughs> I need help. Right, right. I recommend trying new authors, new <laughs> kinds of porn. Yeah. And, um, By the way, porn, uh, speaking of porn, there is a whole stop to porn being made right now. Um, yeah, they, they can't do it. That, which means a lot of porn is on recycle, uh, which uh, is about freaking time. Did you know, Jackie, do you know how many porn videos are out there on the internet? Do you know? No, no, I do not. How many, four Mona? Half, four and a half billion. Million or billion? Billion with a B. I it's feel true. like that's low. That feels low to me. You know, it's- <laughs> <laughs> what do they consider porn? Billion? Okay, well, let's just stop making porn for now. We don't need any more porn. My neighbor is a porn star. Okay. And uh, she's a trans woman. And I discovered through other my neighbors that she is a porn star. And I didn't know that. And she was like, I want to be a stand-up comic. And I was like, it's pretty much like porn. I, I was like, I was like, you can do it. it. I mean, and I was like, you're- you but she gets paid a lot better than we do. And you know that, Jackie. Uh- <laughs> Right. And certainly at, at, at beginner levels. Yeah. Uh, but I, w- I will say there's a woman named Sovereign Sire who was on the Dork Forest. Oh, yeah, my podcast. Her. yeah. And she, her dorkdom, by the way, was uh, the colonization of Florida, which made me laugh <laughs> anyway, by the Spanish. Uh, but she is a, a porn actress and yeah. um, she yeah. has not been working, obviously, for the last five or six months like you do. Yeah. So she has started. I think that there's like everyone's doing sort of lateral things now, right? Yeah. You've yeah. got to reinvent the stream, the income and whatever income anybody does have. Like, like there are people who are still working and yeah. those people still want to pay for porn. Yeah. And so um, she started like, I think, an OnlyFans yeah, or a cameo or some sort of like there's like there's like there's ways that yeah. you could pay Sovereign Sire yeah. to show her ass to you or whatever you would like to see. Um, sure. and, and, and by the way, Sovereign is a, a brilliant woman. Uh, she used to be an educator. Did you know that she was a professor? She was a teacher. I didn't know that she was in the porn industry when she was on the Dork Forest. I just thought she was a very smart because she was doing stand up when we met. 
Very and I, I just thought she would be interesting and smart and on the dork forest. And then her website is uh, porny. It turns out it's slightly. <laughs> porny. And so I got a lot of emails from people saying, Hey, you might want to warn people. I'm like, uh, she's, pretty, uh, she's pretty great. And she's a fellow New Yorker. So I, I really love talking. To oh, her. that's great. Yeah. She's very, uh, she's, she's a lot of fun. Um, yeah. I mean, um, speaking of guys and why they want to do comedy, um, uh, let, 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 let's get into that. I, I, Brian Callen is the recent uh, victim uh, of. <laughs> is he? Is he the recent victim? The recent, uh, I'm not even going to call him the victim. I'm going to call him the recent predator that has been outed. Right. He uh, clearly. I mean, and and I'm a hundred years old. You guys, I have met so many dudes, and you know how they talk you about people. Not a hundred years old. Stop it. Right, but I mean, but I've been doing stand up for so long. I have met so many comics that are varying degrees of predators, right? Yeah. Where the, 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 there's just, there's a, there's a, there's a spectrum. Yes. Uh, and so many of these people are on the spectrum, the a spectrum predator. of predatorism. Yeah, 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 for sure. Man, this COVID haircut is driving me nuts, right? Because I'm looking too much at me. You look great, by the way. Anyway, so going forward. You uh, look fine. I don't know why. Uh, I don't know why I'm twitchy as all hell. But I it's all working. Great. It's, I look uncomfortable in that chair. Do you want to get in another chair? Uh, maybe. Hang on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the chair doesn't seem very fun. <laughs> yes. The foldable chair, baby. Bring it oh, on. This folding chair. Maybe this will be. I'm in my garage, which we uh, we added this tiny room right after, uh, right in March. We had planned to do it. And yeah. so it is just a tiny room attached to our garage. And it is um, it is very slowly being decorated. And so right now, folding card table, folding chair. It's anyway. Right. It, to- it totally works. Jackie, what? If, I mean, look, you've been around for a while. How, right. How- did you experience a lot of predatorial behavior? And you started comedy when there weren't a lot of female comics. Now there's way, so many female comics. There's well, a lot of female know. comics. What yeah. I did not know, and I've, I've talked about this uh, before, is that w- there was only, and, and this still happens, obviously. It's, there's, we have a woman on the show, and you're it. There's one woman. Yeah. And so... Most of my career, I was the only woman in the room. And so I didn't know that it was sexism. I thought it was just ball busting. Mm -hmm. I thought it was just, uh, but what is one of the great things, you know, civilization is very ponderous and very slow, but inexorable and fucking coming for your jackass shitty behaviors. So, um, but the thing is, is, there's enough women in comedy now that there's someone to fucking make eye contact with. That's I right. was in a room once with Beth Stelling yeah, and some banana head, some just, <laughs> you know, uh, some goofball said something horrible. And I had someone that I could look at and go, did you, did you hear that? That was dumb. <laughs> and we got to at least look at each other and go, Oh yeah, that was dumb. Yeah. And so it's yeah. it's nice to have someone you can, s- someone that you can commiserate with instead of just having to suck it up. You know, like any number of sore, horrible, like the the one that I distinctly remember is some some fucking maroon uh, who said, "Hey, we're gonna go. We're gonna go." It was late. We were all hammered. It was after the show. We were gonna go get breakfast, uh, and I was like, "Hey, are we gonna are we gonna go get breakfast?" and and the guy goes, uh, the club owner was like, yeah, you can come if you'll sit on my face. Ah! And I was like, hey, uh, can we just go to breakfast? And uh, <laughs> so, like, like essentially, it's, it's like just bored. Like, just bored. It's just bored. And and these guys, are they're just trying to shock you. Like, there was a, there were several dudes who'd, like, show me lesbian porn because they thought it was funny. they just have it on. And uh, we were going to watch somebody set on VHS and they would put in lesbian porn and then watch me like a dog, you know, <laughs> and you're like, you're a moron. And so I tell these stories 
to women comics and 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 even male comics that are younger than me and they're and they have that look that is on your face right now and they're like you tolerated what and so just a just a basic warning to the guys that are coming up now i am the last generation of women that you will ever hear say He's a nice enough guy. You just don't want to be alone with him. <laughs> just, he's all right. Just don't Jackie, just stand by the door. Jackie, I uh, I would absolutely second that, first of all. And, uh, <laughs> because God knows if a guy comes at me that way, I think my first reaction would be to grab the sharpest thing nearby <laughs> And jab it either in his eye or his thigh. I <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And I, I remember just, you know, and the thing is, you're just like, oh, he's all right. He's just gross. And you're like, actually, he doesn't realize that he's in the workplace and he maybe yeah. shouldn't say shit like that. Yeah. And they're like, no, they're comics. And you're like, no, no. no because I'll tell you something. The male comics that were also sitting there that weren't gross monsters. Yeah. They... We're just, they, I would sometimes make eye contact with them and we'd be like, ah, oh, fuck. Uh, oh, he's the booker. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And uh, so, and you would, to- you would tolerate these things that, that they just, they're unnecessary. You know, they're just like, yes, it yeah. isn't, it isn't cool. And it's, well, and know, it, it's going away. You know what it is, Jackie? I, I feel like there is so much gutting that still needs to happen especially in the comedy world um i feel like you know it started with louis ck and of course bill cosby and it's been like a bit of an avalanche but quite frankly i feel this so this is how i feel about it right so straight white guys or people like bill cosby have been outed however there are these other uh ethnic groups right like they, they met whether they be middle eastern guys or south asian comedians who are very well established and one of the ones i was mentioning to you was russell peters who is li- literally ra- rated listed on forbes as one of the top most uh, uh most uh the, the wealthiest comedians on the planet right he's right. on the fucking forbes list okay and a lot of people don't even know him because he's such a global comic uh, and you know, Chris Rock calls him the most famous comedian nobody knows. That's what Chris Rock calls him. Uh, and he's worth a lot of, lot of money. And he has been a sexual predator for a very, very long time, but he never gets called out. And I now will start telling my story about him. And people are just like, oh my God, really? Are you sure? I'm like, am I sure that I was fucking sexually harassed? Yeah, I'm pretty fucking sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was there. It turns yeah. out. Yeah. And but the thing is, is from the perspective, you don't you it, in the moment, you you don't realize what's happening to some extent because you're like, oh well, maybe this is just locker room talk. Maybe these are just these dude bros and how they talk. But I will say that in that story that you just told. There are no sexual predator stories of Chris Rock. I've heard stories where Chris Rock has been an asshole, sure. uh, but not a monster. You know, yeah. uh, there's stories where I've been an asshole, uh, but also not a monster. Yeah. So, and I will say that that there are there's just we it just has to there's there's no reason there's there's a re, we've tolerated it and. I remember this too. The, this is the other thing is when I was, when I was coming up, mm. um, when I was a little kid, I remember the other thing that I was told about racism that is also true about sexism is that I was told that this was old guy shit. Uh, 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 but this uh, is just uh, old people. They're going to die off. Well, I'm so sorry. There's somebody who's 35 years old. That's been on deck wanting to be a sexual predator. That's right. You know, and those you, Chris D'Elia, And I mean, that guy's in right. his 30s. I think. Brian yeah, I, I, I think that guy's 40. I mean, these are, these are guys that should know better. Right. Right. And Kellen, I mean, he did a heartfelt to the camera. I didn't do this. This isn't real. I categorically deny that this ever happened, which is an interesting premise. He's like, I believe in the me too thing, uh, because this gives a voice to women of these things, but I didn't do this. This is not me. And I also believe in due process. And why was this never? And you're like, here's the thing. I, I believe that 
the, there's levels to this shit, right? Yeah. There is premeditated Bill Cosby. I'm putting a roofie yeah. so that I can fuck the unconscious. Sure. Uh, and then there's Louis C.K. She's not that, she's not a big deal. So I'm just going to block the door with my hard dick in my hand. And, and she's like, Hey, and she's going to jokingly say, man, Hey, we don't need to see this. Can we go? And that's going to get me more excited. And I'm just going to finish real quick here. I'm almost done. And you know, every time, and I've been, I've been date raped twice, right? And both times the excuse was I'm almost done. And literally you're like, fine. Which isn't anything that anyone should ever have to say. Ever, Jackie. Right. You shouldn't. And I shouldn't think it's funny that I'm like, fine, just fucking finish. And then because, but there's another part of me that's always been raised to like, it's just sex. Who the fuck cares? And, but it's, it's also, it's my body, you know, yeah. don't it's be a, a piece of shit. It's a violation, Jackie. It's a violation. That's right. what it's invasive. First of, all, first of all, I am so sorry that you had to endure and go through that shit. Right. I almost got date. I almost got roofied uh, and uh, got mm-hmm. raped. Uh, and I escaped it because I realized that he had put something in my drink. Right. And he was trying to grab my hand and like take me to his hotel room. And I started screaming and I was like, get the fuck off of me. That's it. Yeah. And I was like, get the fuck off of me or I'm going to. But if you're it. scared, if right. you're intimidated, yeah. if you've been raised to think, well, I guess I should just, just suck it up. It'll be fine. Right. right. Those are all not true. Those yeah. are not true. Gentlemen, yeah. don't That's rape. Right. And drive safe. That's uh, a Chad Daniels joke. Uh, that's how he raises his son. He's yeah. got a bumper sticker that says every time his son left the house when he was 16 and above, he'd go, hey, drive safe and uh, don't rape. <laughs> and uh, so uh, it's... Those are very valid points. Those are two very, very valid points. Chad uh, Daniels, uh, there's, I mean, and we should, you know, the thing is, is there, these are, there are so many great male comics that are very funny straight white guys even uh you don't have to support shit bags that's right and if you should support someone who's horrible yes in investigate your why you're doing that that's right. what what are you getting out of that are you getting a tacit approval of your own shitty behavior the yes. fact that you're not gonna ever try to fix yourself that's right. because literally i'm defining people that support Donald Trump and always have right. uh, because that guy, nobody fails upward like that guy. And he just, he makes it okay for worm people to act like shitty worm people. Yep. But you know, who's famous, you know, Chris Rock could say, you know, the most successful comic that nobody's ever heard of is uh, Brian Regan. Mm. Brian, Brian Regan is a good guy. He's Brian one of Regan. the best guys out there. Ian He's- Bagg is one of those two. Ian Bagg is a good guy too. Right. But Brian, but Brian Regan, I, I opened for the guy mm. and it's so interesting to me because when I first started opening for him, I was the first woman that uh, opened for him. And he was wow. like, we gotta, you know, he's been hanging out with his buddies for 20 years yeah. and people are people. This is how people book people. This is how people employ people. You book the people that you hang around with. And if you want more diversity. If you'd like to mix it up, Lewis Lee, the guy who owns Acme always says this. He's like, you know, who's got money? Other people. If I book all straight white guys, it's covered, but you know uh, who might come to the shows. If I also book them, lesbian women, uh, <laughs> black men, uh, whatever, but all the different people, <laughs> there's a niche group that will come and give me $20 That's and right. then they need, they want their perspective told as well. That's right. And That's so right. there's work, there's money there yeah. and don't leave it on the table. Yep. And so, you know, Jackie, um, that's a very, uh, Valid point that you just brought up. So speaking of niche, so my this uh, podcast that I do, uh, Minority Reports, it's also a nationally touring comedy show, right? So I started off at the comedy store like five years ago with the show. Um, and then I took it to, you know, I started touring with it. So I took, yeah. it, I took it to Orange County. And, you know, you talk about diversity, right? You talk about diversity. We did a uh, Desi Girls Night. Desi is a slang way of saying South Asian. And okay. we had 300 South Asian women show up. Just to fascinated, come. excited, shocked. What this is gonna be right? 
I was like, wait, what the fuck is happening right now? And then I get a call from LA Times. They're like, hi, did you know that you're the talk of the town? I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? They're like, people are like clamoring to get to your show because their market is never catered to. And you're bringing a show that is never catered to. These women, Jackie, did not want to go home. After the show ended, it was a giant dance party. They refused to go home. One woman got drunk off her ass, and she was like, I'm fucking tired of talking to my husband. I'm fucking tired of making sandwiches for the kids. <laughs> one night to go wild. They got to meet other people. They got to meet other like-minded people who were also looking for state, like other comedy fans that also happen to be South Asian. You know, you're just like, this is, this is good for absolutely fucking everyone. So Brian Regan, so I'm the first woman and he, you know, I get this call from, first of all, he, his manager emails me. He's like, have you heard of Brian Regan? And I was like, yes. Yes, I've heard of Brian Regan. He's like, he watched one of your videos online. He was wondering if you'd be interested in opening for him. And I'm like, yes, yes, I'm interested in opening for him. And uh, and then I show up and he's at some performing arts center with thousands of people. The only way that I could open for him was to think it was funny because it's, uh, I walked in to, to, I did Carnegie Hall with him. Wow. Wow. And I, and I laughed and he was like, what's so funny? And I said, your career. Your career is hilarious and wonderful, Brian Regan. Anyway, so, but what you do, he has a bus, right? With bunk beds and he has a, he more more or less lives on it. And then the tour manager and the comic, everybody has their own bunks. And because sometimes you drive in between gigs, right? Like a band kind of. Uh And he was, he didn't want me to be uncomfortable. So he invited his children and their nanny yeah. To be on the, the first like four or five weekends that I did with him. Wow. Just because wow. he wanted to be, he was like, I know that I'm going to be respectful, but I don't want her to be nervous at all. And I was like, I have been hanging out with the disrespectful and uh, uh, it's going to be fine in any case. But I had genuinely appreciate, you know what Brian Reagan is? He's a thoughtful adult man. Yeah. It's very, they exist. It's a delight. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many like Chad Daniels, should be Louis C.K., right? He should have that fan base Mm -hmm. because he is sane and hilarious uh, and not an idiot, not a monster, not a bad person. There's Augie Smith. Augie Smith is sort of the Joe Rogan, but sane and nice. And not a Trump supporter. Um, And, And not a fucking moron. Like the thing about Joe Rogan is that he's a button. There's, he's just a finger, man. The guy's just a giant button pusher and who I don't want to hang out with anymore are a bunch of fingers. I don't want to hang out with those guys. Yes. I mean, look, he got, I do have a dream of being fingered to death. That's how I want to (laughs) go. I love. Jackie, I think you already got that covered. You married a good man. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to dive when, when I've reached an orgasm and then it's over for me. Uh, that's uh, exactly how I picture my death, uh, which would be amazing. Um, I mean, you know, um, you were talking about Brian Regan, you know, uh, and uh, you knew that, you know, and he was so kind and thoughtful that he brought a nanny and you know, to make sure that, you know, you become, you get comfortable uh, it's interesting because uh, Russell Peters, uh, speaking of going back to him, uh, watch one of my very beautiful friends, a very funny comic friends uh, at the Laugh Factory. Uh, she gets done. She gets comes on stage and uh, he looks at her and he goes, that was a very funny set person's name. Well, what, I don't want to reveal her name because she's not ready to. And uh, he, she goes, oh my God. She goes, thank you so much. She goes, hey, uh, Russell, you know, I know you tour around the world. Like, I would love to go on tour with you. I would love to open for you. And she goes, he goes, aw, I would totally let you, but I want to fuck you the entire time. So probably not. Right. Which is a classic. That's a that's an old chestnut. Uh, that old chestnut uh, is something that guys would be like, well, but uh, I had a guy one weekend, the whole week, he's like, we had to share a condo. And he was like, let's just fuck. We're here. We're just, we're, we just have each other. We're, there's nothing else to do. We're, we're going back to the condo anyway. And every night he would say it. And every night I'm like, it's not happening. And, uh, and then New Year's Eve, he was like, it's New Year's Eve, man. Let's just fuck. And I'm like, it's <laughs> 
I was like, we've had four days of this, dude. It's not happening. Jackie, Jackie, you didn't have the urge to just punch him in his ugly mouth? <laughs> no, I did have the urge to put my chair in front of my door, though, which I, uh, which I, and he wasn't, and here's the thing. He wasn't threatening. He was just in, but that is threatening. I mean, if you think about it, right. But I just, I was like, you're an idiot. And he, and, but other people who were, would seriously take that. They'd be like, no, no, that is a threat. He is actually (laughs) saying, uh, you know, the inference is that we should just do this. You should just, just cave and just do that. Correct. That's correct. Uh, But please tell me, please tell me this person is not famous or doesn't work anymore. Oh, he works. Are you kidding? He's just an old dinosaur of a dude. He's just, he's one of these, he's one of the comics I do this bit about now, about how there's four dudes who have said, you can't even flirt anymore, man. You can't even flirt. You talk to a woman, she thinks you're harassing her. And I bet you he thought that that was flirting. Because that is not yeah. flirting. Yeah. Because, and I looked up the definition of flirting. It turns out flirting actually is harassment. It's either successful harassment or unsuccessful harassment. <laughs> but I will say that there's, and the best definition of flirting that I read, and I read a bunch of them, was this one. Get this one. An interaction with another person wherein you make the other person feel good about themselves. And I was like, who is doing that. And then I realized it's my dad, Elliot Cation, aging horn dog. Uh, (laughs) My dad um, hit on Maria Bamford, one of my best friends at my wedding. What? And uh, yeah. And in his defense, uh, she was at that time, a tiny 35 year old blonde woman, which is his favorite kind of person in the whole planet. Uh Uh, And she told me this recently. And I said, I am so sorry. And she goes, don't be sorry. He didn't touch me. He didn't even say anything weird. I just got the impression that he thought I was pretty. And I was like, that's the weird definition of flirting. How did he do it? And she goes, I have no idea. And so I went home and I asked him, and that is a longer story. But it's, I mean, it was amazing. (laughs) Uh, I, uh, have been, uh, I've been, I, I have uh, managed to, in my uh, career thus far, managed to uh, build a reputation of, uh, Mona will tell you to go fuck yourself to your face. Um, <laughs> so don't approach Mona that way. Uh, yeah. uh, which is, which is a good thing, which is, I'd rather come across as a hard ass shrew. Uh, and uh, versus having to deal with it and then trying to process it, you know, well, to some extent it feels like, to, and, and this is, I don't understand why I have to finish raising a 30 year old man. You know, there's like, there's like, that actually is not okay that you right. said that. Right. Okay. Why, why am I, why do I have to explain that to you? You're a grown right. up person. And, but I will say this, do you know, Sean, mm, Oh, Sean Patton. Have you ever seen Sean Patton? Uh, no, but I've heard that name. It, uh, he's one of the, there was, okay, so the, the, we're in a comedy boom right now. Right now, it's women. Yeah. There's yeah. like all of the younger, like 28 to 40, these yeah. women who've been in it for like 10 to 15 years yeah. are blowing up and they're super smart and they're, they're awesome comics. Yeah. But about 15 years ago, there were these uh, dudes there was a whole pile of the bearded youth movement. Remember those yeah. guys? Yeah. It was yeah. Kyle Kinane. Yeah. And Sean Patton was on the tail end of that, but Matt Broner. Now I remember. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. but he's got this great story. He grew up outside of uh, New Orleans. He grew up in Louisiana. And he tells this crazy ass story of him being, he was the dishwasher at some restaurant. And he hit on the, uh, there was a Christmas party and he hits on the woman, the hostess, the woman who seats everybody. And she, is cruel and is mean because he's 17 and she's 23 and he's Sean Patton. And she's like, he's the dishwasher and uh, they're at this Christmas party for the, for the thing. And then he sees the cool waiter roofie her beer. <gasps> and he switches beers because he has the same unop- kind of beer. And so he tells this amazing story of how he did this. And I was like, after she was mean to you and he was like, well, that didn't have anything to do with it. Right. It was just, you don't let someone be rude. And I was like, yes, because you're an adult man. Yeah. You're a grown up human at being. At 17. At 17. Yeah. And then the funny part of that story was that he then drank that beer because he was 17 and poor. So he roofied himself. <laughs> and 
That is by far one of the most hilarious shows. I think it's on his oh, current God. album, John Patton. You should find it because it's fucking hilarious. That is so funny. And then so touching. Yes. Oh. He must get laid based off just off that story. <laughs> I, think, I believe him to be in a committed monogamous relationship. Oh, so he is I, do a, I do not know. I do not know. He's definitely he's definitely getting he's definitely getting it on the regular. And good for Sean. He should get it on the regular. Yes. Good yeah. for him. He's, he's a good guy. Yeah. Man, I, I honestly feel like, you know, uh whenever here's here's the thing, Jackie. So when the whole Chris D'Elia thing came out, right? Uh, look, I love Neil Brennan. I have respected him for a long time. But Neil Brennan came out and said that I will give a thousand dollars or something stupid like that for every proof that's shown or given to me. That, that and then I, tweet okay. deleted. Tweet and deleted. deleted the tweet. So, <laughs> so my thing is, Jackie, that what whenever uh, comedians like male comic come out and support other predator. I stop and I say, what kind of what kind of skeletons do you have in your closet? Right. Right. It isn't cool. What it kind isn't- of like, yeah, and then Neil like totally pivoted and like totally changed the conversation and was like, Oh, look at the birds. They said, Aren't the birds so pretty? And you're oh, like shiny, shiny. Yeah. yeah. And it's- I'm like, oh, you you were fucking giving away a thousand dollars. That's another thing, Jackie. When I look at you, when I look at you, Lori, uh, when I look at other female comics, uh, you know, that have made a name for themselves uh, and are uh, up, you know, really coming up the pipeline and really making some strong statements. We don't need men to speak on our behalf. We are very fucking capable of speaking on our own fucking behalf. Yeah. And the learning curve right now for Whitey Magoos on that same topic and, and men. Straight male Magoos, Jackie. Straight male Magoos. Straight male Magoos are, have, have, it's just tick a lock time. You know, it was very funny. One of my, uh, a couple of my brothers have recently discovered sexism and told me that there might be more sexism than I might know about. And I was like, no, no, boots on the ground over here, buddy. And, uh, so, but, but, you know, cause, it's so funny talking to them because they they are the best. My my brothers are the closest I get to being, and my husband, uh, that I get to being treated like a person. Okay. You know, uh, just a, just a piece, just a stalk of meat with a brain, yeah. and uh, and like my brothers, like I treat you like people, and I was like very close. You're almost nailing it, <laughs> but you know, it's it's that whole thing about what we what women want or what. What anybody wants is yeah. literally just to be able to make like the gold standard of, of being a person is a straight white guy. Yeah. And if you Google on YouTube, if you YouTube Google the words bad male decisions, there is a rabbit hole that has no bottom. I spent a half an hour watching dudes with ladders, just lad- ladder in a wheelbarrow, ladder on a goat, just ladder on a tippy thing, where it's just one guy after another going, it's just going to be a second, I'm just going to get up there real quick, and then bam! And at no time is there another dude going, hey man, uh, wait a minute. But you could picture a guy going, hey man, wait a minute while I grab my camera. Because literally, and if you YouTube Google bad female decisions, crickets, there's nothing there. And it's not that we aren't dumb. We're stupid. We're just as dumb. Uh, but we can't film it because they would lock us up. And <laughs> we just want to be treated like someone who can make regrettable decisions <laughs> yeah. and then just either be made fun of them or be supported in them, right? right. And yes... I am somewhat talking about abortion. Anyway, and everything, absolutely yeah. every decision any woman's ever made, it yeah. should just be, oh, you're a person who made a dumb decision. Yes. 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 I had ice cream for breakfast. It was 100%. dumb. 100%. You know, uh, Jackie, I feel like you tell me how you feel about this. Do you feel like when uh, male comics come out and and get, get very angry about topics, about social justice, and they do these rants and everybody's like, oh, my gosh, yes, you're so wise. And then you come out or I come out and do a passionate rendition and do a passionate rant and that is also funny but also angry and passionate. They're like, she's really angry. Like she's really oh completely. Like, really? I I saw it one night. Um, the night before I'd seen Bill Burr, and Bill mm-hmm. Burr is very funny, and yes. he is ranty as all hell. Yes, and uh, he That's murdered very nice a nine- very nice, very oh, nice. Guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, 
No, no tales have been told. I know nothing about Bill Burr. Uh, he's always been distantly polite to me. Yeah. Anyway, so, uh, which is all I've ever wanted out of yeah. anyone more successful, quite honestly. Yeah. You don't have to want to be my best friend. It's okay. Because yeah. okay. uh, I get it. You meet a lot of people. Yeah. So anyway, Bill Burr, very funny, does this rant and the audience on their feet, carried him off stage. No, they didn't. But I mean, like literally they were psyched. The next night, Eliza Schlesinger. Uh-huh did something very comparable. And it was also very funny. Uh, and the audience was almost there for her. Mm-hmm. It was it was very parallel. And granted, Bill Burr's been doing stand-up probably 10 years longer than she has. Sure. So he's got more more chops. But it is it was exactly what you said, you know? I mean, the 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 jokes were there, the premises were there, it was the same type of thing. Yeah. The response was very different because because sometimes it's very different. Audience sees a big sausage wrapping, and they're like, "I don't like Italian sausage with a vagina." Exactly. What? What just happened. Oh, I don't. I don't. I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear this kind of estrogen talk coming. Well, when I when I first started, there was a guy who who came who was there in the very beginning, who did this. I was the only woman, as per usual, and it was me and six other comics in Madison, Wisconsin, when we first started doing stand up, and there was a guy. Um, who sort of did one-on-ones with us where we would record our, our stand-up and then he would go over our set with us and help us out. It was unsolicited, always a terrible idea, stand-up comics. Uh, unsolicited advice, always terrible. Okay, so, um, but he meant well and we all sat through it because he was more, he was a comedy store guy in 1984. We didn't know he had also been doing stand-up comedy for two years, but he sat with us. And, and when he sat with me, he told me that women, nobody wants to hear women swear. And he replayed me saying the word fuck over and over and over again on this tape. He's like, see how unattractive and the audience just tightens up on you. You don't want that. And I was like, interesting. He said one thing that made sense and is true. When you swear, you're, it's, it's lazy writing. But sometimes it's lazy writing that has a hard K on it that really makes a joke work a lot better. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so, but so fuck that guy. But uh, the thing is, fuck that guy is indeed. <laughs> actually, uh, fuck that motherfucker. Let me be <laughs> very specific on that one. What a piece of shit. Uh, <laughs> and anyway, but I love to curse, Jackie. That's how I keep my teeth white. Are you fucking kidding me? I love to curse. Oh yeah, it's a good one. I, yeah, yeah. I cur- like the thing. I do. I do a lot of different kinds of shows, obviously, and I can do all the kind of shows you want me to do. Right. And so whenever a corporate happens, like I've been doing online, I've been doing these things that I call mini muffin Monday shows. Mm-hmm. And it's essentially what would you spend for a month of mini muffin Monday for your, for your corporate? Would you spend $500? Do you want me to do like, I'm like, I'll do for you and your friends or you and your coworkers, a 10 minute set for a hundred bucks, a 30 minute set for 500 bucks. Or a forty-five to sixty minute set for two thousand dollars. At which point, my husband, my husband has said, Andy goes, "I take it you want to do a ten minute set." Anyway, and I was like, well, "I kind of want to do the thirty. And I've done a couple of thirties, and so, but in both cases, they were, you know, they were sort of small. A uh, couple of uh, there were three or four of them now, and I was just like, "Just tell me." Like I, I, I don't have anything filthy. Like I don't do a lot of. I don't have any sort of. I don't. I don't think about bodily functions when I'm on stage. I tend to think bodily functions when I'm having them. So uh, that's, I don't have any jokes. So, and I'm not particularly dirty, but I can, I do swear sometimes. So if you don't want me to do that is what I always say during corporates, uh, pipe up because my brain is attached to my mouth and uh, we can can wrap it up. You know, Jackie, uh, one of the things uh, that I also uh, think about a a lot as a female comic, uh, as a comic and also as a female comic, because it plays a huge role, and that's the thing we're we're talking about here, is the fact that um, um, when you look at the uh, top 10 list of the most successful comedians, uh, there is not a single female comic on that lineup. Um, And... um, uh, I want to know uh, how further along is it going to take for us uh, to get that female George Carlin, to get that female uh, Richard Pryor, uh, to get that female Chris Rock, to get that no. female Bill Burr. When do we I get- have been in a comedy club, but there's always a poster of Lucille Ball. 
and I always want to light it on fire. Uh, she didn't do stand up, Lucille Ball. I don't That's know. Right. Uh, the I can't. I can't fucking deal with it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. But you know, there's. I was like, you know, you go into a helium, and the, these are heliums are kind of state of the art as far as chain club goes. Right. I mean, they kind of, they've nailed it six times across the country. They're beautiful clubs. They run incredibly well. And there's always uh, a thousand pictures of 11 by seven, 17 uh, photos of a bunch of dudes. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I would love it if there would be a picture. And sometimes there's Whitney Cummings and sometimes there's Nikki Glaser and sometimes but I mean, the thing is, you could put, I mean, there's comics, you know, Wendy Liebman yeah. has been doing stand up comedy since before me and should be on television, in my opinion, every night doing a different four and a half minutes until she runs out of four and a half minutes. And what will happen is 365 days later, you will have had a year of Wendy Liebman. Yeah. And so fucking put a picture of Wendy Liebman on the, you know, John Rivers. I mean, come on. Joan right. Rivers, you could do that. Miss Pat, are you kidding me? Yeah. From Chicago. And uh, so, I mean, these, Judy Gold, uh, these are people that are still working. Paula yeah. Poundstone. Yeah. These are, there's, you want, you want women that have been doing it for 40 years. You want women who've been doing it for 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. You could do Maria Bamford. You could yeah. do Sarah Silverman. You, and then there's all these new, young, awesome comics. Then one can also do Jackie Cashian. Sure, you can do. Yeah, you, I, I I got good pictures, you guys. I got a nice headshot. Frame it nice. Put it right up there. I see pictures, Jackie. I like them. I like them a lot. Like, I got good headshots. Yeah, like you know, I I recently I saw you in a plaid shirt, and uh, and I was like, man, I love plaid shirts. Uh, and my gay friends recently told me they're like, you know, like plaid shirts are very big with lesbians. And I was like, am I the most uh, straight lesbian that's out there uh, playing. Les you guys don't lesbians. You guys don't get to own plaid shirts. What? Everybody can get to wear a, you know, uh, plaid shirts. Sometimes they're in, they're in, in vogue the plaid shirt, and plus they're colorful. And you know what I have uh, well, taken from some of my friends. Comfort they're, is vital. they're super soft and comfortable, but I like I like in headshots for sure. I like a lot of primary colors to sort yeah. of um, it helps. Right, it makes the whole picture pop, and they're more fun. It's yeah. more vibrant. I, I agree with you. I, I'm, I'm a very likable comic. It is made more plain to people when I am in a bright color. Relatable, <laughs> exactly. So relatable. Uh, speaking of relatable, uh, what the fuck is going on with Ellen DeGeneres? Oh my gosh, I don't know. I mean, here's the thing. There's two. There's two ways to go with this. Of course, there are. She's an asshole. That's too bad. Um, so um, sometimes your boss is an asshole. Wow. Uh, second thing is nobody's called her. I mean, there's a problem with famous people in general in the fact that nobody tells them that they're being a dick and mm -hmm. nobody and people just tolerate shit. If you think about Mitch Hedberg, who was a delight, mm -hmm. he was a very sweet man. Also, uh, incredibly thoughtless, not the most thoughtful guy on the planet, but a huge heroin addict. In addition to that, right. not everybody, they, they booked him weeks. They booked him with David tell Lewis black and him on a tour, two weeks out of rehab and wow. Lewis black has a hollow leg. That guy drinks, uh, David tell, uh, had a show on Comedy Central about getting drunk. And why would you, why don't you, why don't you let Mitch, he didn't need the money, you know, give him a year, give him three months, man. Yeah. He could have be alive to this day. Yeah. Mitch Hedberg, one of the sweetest guys in the world, you yeah. know, and super silly, smart comic. If you get a chance, if you don't know him, uh, to the people watching, if there are people watching. I mean, and, very original, incredibly original. Yeah, yeah, super fun and, and original and smart and sweet and great. It's, there's so many, and whenever anybody, I, like, I don't know. I've heard for years that Ellen is a shitty boss. That's what I've heard scuttlebutt-wise. I didn't yeah. hear that she was a monster. Yeah. And I didn't hear that she was, um, 
I heard that she was just almost, she was just really hard to work for her. And you lasted as long as you lasted until you got your WGA insurance yeah. and the, and your credits. And then you did a lateral move to someone who wasn't such a pain in the ass to work for. You know, um, uh, I, I had, I had heard about Ellen DeGeneres from uh, two of my friends and they're both, they're both in the business. One is actually uh, a comedian, a female comic by the name of Chris uh, Farah. She's a, she's an Arab comic. Uh, she's very, she's a great gal. And when she, uh, before she got into comedy, she used to wait tables. And uh, so she's waiting tables and Ellen DeGeneres and Portia come in and uh, she's serving them. And uh, apparently she had a chipped nail uh, and Ellen DeGeneres uh, apparently got up and went and spoke to the manager and said that she does not want this server because she had a chipped nail and she has to look at it every time she would approach her table. And Chris Farah just did an interview that actually just came out today. I think uh, I forget one publication came out on, and she tells her that story. That sounds like OCD. That sounds like oh, this woman's dirty somehow, right? Because oh. she's nail. But I mean, if you just take that, and if you have to work with somebody like that, who's like you can't even make eye contact with me or some sh- bullshit like that, you're just like, oh my god, seriously. Here's the thing, Jackie. We're all adults, right? <laughs> yeah. Doing- if you're being an asshole and you're being you're on a successful ass show, you're going around talking about kindness and smiling and happiness and oh, yeah, yeah. fucking kumbaya and shit, okay? And then you're a total fucking jackass. Asshole. Yeah. L- let me use let me use a lighter word. Cunt. If you're a total cunt backstage, that is a problem. That is a problem, Jack. That's a real problem. That's a real problem. The thing, the problem. And and it's and it's it's about we were talking about it before we got on, which is the power thing, you know, is that uh, someone gets power, and yeah. then they get this attitude, you know. And here's the thing: is from what I've heard, is that some of these people were perfectly nice people yeah. before. Like, I have two podcasts, and um, I have, I don't know, maybe. 11,000 hardcore fans. Let's say that. Right. And those are some very, very nice people that who like me and who cut me a great deal of slack. Um, They could also, uh, they also email me and tell me when uh, I'm being a dick. But, uh, but the thing is, is it's mostly because I'm uh, accessible. Right. But I think that you can get to a point where you have hundreds of thousands of, of fans yeah. Where if you don't have either the upbringing or the self-esteem, like if you have a self-esteem problem and you're like, okay, finally enough people like me, I can be the piece of shit I've always wanted to be. Like, <laughs> if you think about it, like Mark Marin, yeah, has hundreds of thousands. He's got millions of fans, right? Yeah. And he is enormously successful. Yeah. He has, he's done the work. Yeah. He's done the work on himself. Yeah. To be a better person where he questions his, his, he questions his attitudes, he questions his actions and he, and it's part of his shtick now, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's questioning your attitude and questioning your actions is a learned task anyway. It's a muscle memory thing that started when Mark Maron didn't have millions of fans. So luckily now he's still checking it and he's still like, am I? You know, it's he he has a famous thing, and I remember he did it to me in 1999. Came up to me at a at a um, at the improv, and he goes, "Why don't you like me, Cation?" And I was like, "What what are you talking about? You're the one who doesn't like me. I, I'm always super nice to you." And he's like, "I like you," and I was like, "Why are we having this conversation?" <laughs> and so, but he thinks that people don't like him, so mm. he's sort of that overcompensating, wants to be a good guy, yeah. and. That's like, we started talking about that, like as the youngest to six and, and, and little, you know, pick up, go get your dad some coffee kind of thing. Yeah. This creates a sort of, a. it's created in me anyway, a desire to be of service to yeah. other people. And yeah. I, I think in some ways that, that makes you a better person, you yeah. know? I mean, as long as you don't let people, as long as you, you, you don't let it be the only thing about you. Yeah. And you don't let people take advantage of it. You have to have some boundaries, right? Some people yeah. have to learn those boundaries. Right. And that's a that's a muscle memory thing too. Sure, sure. Um, I yeah, I mean I, I, I agree with you. I, I think um I think it's exactly that, right? I think I think what you're talking about is accountability. 
is what you're talking about. He holds it's himself accountable. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. holds himself accountable. You hold yourself accountable. I hold myself accountable. But yeah. I feel like some people, maybe it seems like in Ellen's case, I mean, this is not just one or two people. I mean, these are tons of people. I mean, these are people that are serving her fucking pasta, for God's sake. And they're like, dude, she's being a bitch to me. Like, why? Well, right, and, and, and I have heard many comics and many writers and many people that have worked with her over the decades say that she's very hard to work with. But um, it is, that, you know, p- part of that is created by the pressure that those people put on themselves. I heard Letterman was very hard to work for, too. You know, because he had such a a perfectionist attitude and he had such a, you know, he, there's a reason Eddie Brill didn't have women comics on that show. And it wasn't because Eddie Brill was unwilling to have women on that show is because David Letterman didn't want to have women on that show. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it was. I mean, that's the way it was, you know, just uh, stop it. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> right like stuff he got oh, yeah. he got out just in time let me tell you that jackie he got out just in time like right it's uh yeah i mean if you think about it like the the his head writer for a long time was meryl marco she created that sort of man on the street the the dumb animal tricks the dumb people tricks all of those sketches that he did for the show the panel show she created most of those and they were also in a relationship you know, for 10, 15 years. And then um, it turns out he was having affairs and it sort of fell apart. And so she left and then he married um, someone young enough to be his daughter. And then, so, yes. uh, So, but it doesn't, but you know, the, the, so I say that, but as my, this generation woman comic, I'm just like, but he's a nice enough guy, you know, just stand by the door. And uh, so, I mean, there's just like, there's these old dinosaur comics that you're like, that's how it was. Okay. You got up, you got out just in time. You get a pass. Yeah. I don't want a 30 year old version of that guy. That's right. I don't yeah. want a 35 year old version of that guy. I mean, and we all I, need to not tolerate it to some extent. I mean, yeah, I agree. I, 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 okay. And there are also two things, right? One thing is being very difficult. The other is, you know, uh, pulling your pants down and saying, "Hey, do you like what you see?" Right? Those, so those are two kind of separate thing, things we're looking at. I think in Ellen's case, she was just very difficult to work with. I, yeah. I'm not hearing sexual allegations or anything. No, like that. no. Though I understand that the, uh, and I haven't, I have not heard enough of the allegations either. But there was some racial problems as mm-hmm. well. But I think it just it manifested. Here's here's something about racism. I would like to build myself a small statue. Uh, here, whenever I've gotten mad at <laughs> anybody, that job, Jackie. Let me take over. <laughs> it's a whenever I've gotten mad at somebody who happens to be black or brown or gay or trans, um, I um, have never reduced it to name calling about what they look like or what their jam is. Right. Right. I've always just gone to a nice gender neutral asshole. (laughs) Hey, you're a fucking piece of shit. Um, So, which I think it's, it's nice. It's blankety. It covers it. They, they get it that I'm not happy with them, that they've done something incorrect. They don't need to be called a name. Some weird ass. I once, uh, punched a uh, heckler and uh this isn't okay but wow. here, here it's early days 1986 anyway so i'm doing a one-nighter a four-waller in the like a best western bar right and um i'm on stage and i'm eating it and there's hecklers and they won't shut up and so i get off stage and i walk by the hecklers uh a 10 minute set it did not go well uh, shall we say I did the best I could I tried to deal with the two hecklers there were other hecklers but I, had to walk- that, Jackie. <laughs> I walked by the two hecklers one of them has passed out he's head down on the table the other heckler still talking to me as I walk past him and the comic on stage who happened to be Steve Marmel uh, was like hey man heckle me I'm up here now hey anyway but that guy uh, did not um he didn't. He kept talking to me. So I go up to the bar and I'm mad like you are when you didn't have a good set. And I order a beer and I get a mug of beer and I'm drinking my beer, fuming. And the heckler guy comes and stands right behind me. He's about six feet tall. And I make a very, very mature decision at the age of 20 uh, that I'm going to, uh, if this guy talks to me one more time, I'm going to throw my beer at him. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> it's not a mature decision. I do not recommend this. But instead, I feel him touch my shoulder. And I was told later by the bouncer and by the, the bartender that he was reaching over my shoulder to grab my boob. Woo! Uh, yeah, right. I didn't, I didn't see, I just heard him touch my shoulder. I turn around, throw my beer at him, missing him completely. Hitting the man, <laughs> hitting the man behind him full in the face. No! I know. So this, this story, by the way, has a great uh, button. But the thing is, is so the heckler then picks up that guy's drink and whips it at me. <gasps> and so I'm soaked. The guy behind the heckler soaked. And that guy starts uh, laughing. <gasps> laughing. I punch him right in the face, forgetting Ooh. that I'm holding the beer mug. <gasps> so I clocked him with the beer mug, dropped him. He falls to the ground. He gets up and he starts screaming at me. You fucking dyke is what he tells me. And, um, and I said, you got a problem with homosexuality faggot. This is not my strongest. Uh, this is, this is not my finest moment uh, in any there's violence. There's name calling. There's uh, drunkenness. It isn't good. And um, they separated us. They kicked us both out of the club, by the way. And we never dated because it wasn't a romantic comedy. But <laughs> there is an addendum to this. As Hollywood would have you believed. As Hollywood would have you believe, we would now be married. Uh, but here's, here's the addendum to that story. Five, six years later, I'm doing a one-nighter. I'm featuring for a guitar comic from Wisconsin whose name I can never remember. Uh, he's got a guitar perfectly nice guy. We're driving together in the car. We're exchanging heckler stories. Uh, the guitar comic driving the headliner tells me my own story. He tells me that story. He was the guy who got hit with the drink. <laughs> and I was like, wait, you were the guy. And so we literally, it was 1991. I think we had to pull over and use a pay phone so he could call his wife and I could call my sister. And we had to tell people that we had finally re reunited. And so he, I hit another comic with my drink and then we worked together on the road, uh, six years later. That is a fantastic story, Jackie. An amazing story. Absolutely fantastic. It freaking reminds me you know i uh whenever i do the road uh i think one of the things that i always like to ask my the comics that i'm working with is like how, do you experience physical violence because that's <laughs> your job it has this hazardous part to it that i think a lot of people don't know that people try to come and like physically attack you or try to challenge you to a fucking fight after a show yeah yeah you know? um, there's nothing i i yeah there, there can be physical, alt you have to, it, it isn't, it isn't the safest gig in the world, but no, it not. isn't, but it's, you're going to live your life in fear. You're not gonna, you're no, not gonna, you gotta do stand up comedy. Jackie, I was doing a show in DC about two years ago and um, it was a college gig. It was a day gig, college gig. I did it. And then in the evening I got invited to do, to headline two shows, like two places across the street from each other. Okay. Awesome. So I headline one, have a great time. I go across and I uh, I walk in. It's not a lot of people. There are these three women that are sitting up front, uh, the white ladies, uh, and they're sitting up front. And uh, one is like absolutely shit faced and she's heckling every comic that's going on stage. Uh, and um, two of the, two of them were gay, uh, and and I think they were they were together. They were they were lovers, right? So. I, I notice every comic that goes up is fucking getting heckled and nobody's calling these women out. I'm like, this is, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm like, ah, shit. And I was like, if they fucking heckled me, we know how this shit is going to go down. So I go on stage and I start telling my joke and I'm telling a Bill Cosby joke. And it's not about rape. It's about Bill Cosby because he's a piece of shit. And I'm like in the middle, I'm about to tell, a, to, tell, tell the punchline. And she's like, I didn't hear you. And I was like, I was like, if you keep quiet, you would hear what I have to say. So, shh, okay. I carry on. I'm about to tell a second joke, okay? And she's like, rape isn't funny. And I'm like, nobody fucking said rape was funny. I was like, this. I'm going to give you two options. I said, either you're going to shut the fuck up or get the fuck out. So what's it going to be, okay? So all the comics in the back start applauding. I'm like, fuck you. I'm like, fuck you guys. I'm like, you should have been here a long time ago. I'm yeah. like, why do I have to clean up this mess? Okay. Yep. 
So the um, uh, the more on the, uh, I would say, the butchy side uh, lover person was at the bar. And she sees me telling her girlfriend to fuck off. So she walks up to me on stage and puts her forehead on my forehead and starts to push me back. Okay? She wants to get in a physical fist fight with me. Jack. Are you in Yellowstone? And are you <laughs> two moose? What's happening? <laughs> I didn't even know. I had never experienced this this kind of thing in my life. That's insane. It's insanity. So I'm like, what the fuck? So I'm like, I'm like, you know what, bitch? I grew up in New York. If you want to fucking go, we can go. Let's go. Right? Let's fucking punch each other's lights out. I was like, because I'm not fucking going down. Fuck you. Right? So she started pushing me back. So all the other comedian friends, they get in and they start like pulling us apart. I'm like, no, no, fuck her. I'm like, I'm going to fucking knock her lights out here. You know? So it's getting really crazy. So she goes to me, she goes to me, why don't you be funnier? Why don't you be funnier? So, you know, I'm just like, oh, I'm like, oh, you want me to be funnier? Here's a joke for you. I'm like, how is it that you eat so much pussy, but you got a motherfucking horse face, bitch? How the fuck does that work? And everybody loses their fucking yeah. Again, yeah, it's not my greatest moment. Not the no, no. Moment. These are not. These are not. They're, they're, the thing is, is they're just war stories. You know, they're just like they're just in the moment. You know, right? And moment. because you have to. The problem is, is that if you don't stand up, yes, then they win. Yes, you can't. There is that you have to control the room. Yeah, you can't. And the thing is, is I have known comics who are like. Oh, fuck that. I don't actually care that much. And I was like, I wish I had that attitude to some extent, yeah. but I don't. I, I don't have a lot of back down in me. Yeah. I wish I had, I wish, I wish I were more even and I yeah. am getting more even. Right. I mean, the thing is, is well, how can it, why? But I know, but I know this too. A lot of people don't understand this. If you don't do your time, yes. you do not get paid. Yeah. You don't get paid. I did a show in Montana. Mm-hmm. And what uh, the comic I was working with, the the uh, I was closing, and the um, the owner of the club came over and said, "I don't like her. I want her to get off early." And I said, "She won't." Mm. And he goes, uh, "Well, what can't we just light her and she'll get off?" And I said, "No, no, because you hired her to do a certain amount of time, and she's going to do every minute of it because mm-hmm. she needs to get paid." And mm-hmm. he's like, "Well, how to? I just want her. I don't like her." And I said. Yeah, well, you hired her. Yeah. Uh, she's gonna do her time, yeah. and she to the second she fight because she he started lighting her at thirty, yeah, and she did forty five, and oh, wow. we were all doing forty. It was a dumb, it was a dumb production, but uh, too many, too too long, too long. The show's too long. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. uh, his error. Anyway, so he's lighting her, and I was like, she's not leaving. She will. She is a professional comedian, and we'll be doing every moment that you hired her to do so that you have no excuse not to sign the goddamn check. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I feel like I, I feel um, whenever like, it's like moments like this and you know, uh, the craziest thing is Jackie, that's uh, like maybe three or four months after that I'm in the Valley. I don't know. I'm doing some bar show for fun. Okay. And uh, like for fun, like just working out new stuff. And uh my my name gets called and there's this girl sitting in the back. She and she like applauding really loudly for me to get her. I'm like, who the fuck is this? You know, who is this person? So I get done. I get off stage. Uh, I come back and she comes and sits next to me and she's like, you don't. She's like, you were in D.C. weren't you three four months ago? And I was like, she was. At the I was like, um, I was like, who are you? Who are you? And she was like, she was like, I was there that night. Uh, she was like, I was there that night when you called the bitches out. She goes, she was like, can I tell you something? What you did for me that night? And I was like, no, please do tell. I hope I didn't ruin you. What did I do? She's like, so I'm really new to comedy. And there was this other young girl. She was next to me and she was new to comedy. And when we saw you stand up to those hecklers, it gave us so much courage. And now we don't take shit from anybody. Right. I would, I'll tell you this is when I first moved, to, that's oh, awesome. That is so funny. I mean, the thing is, is there's part of you that wants no witnesses so you can tell the story like you want to tell the story. <laughs> and, <laughs> and another part of you is like, you were there. You were there with the Nazis in, in, at, the, at the Rosemont I was, scared, exactly. I was scared because it was the name calling that had happened and it scared me. It's terrifying. The thing is, is it's, it's, 
it is you genuinely there were there was a woman in a Trump hat in the front row uh, at Rosemont Zanies, and I was afraid, genuinely afraid for my life. And I did how long ago, every. How long was this? Uh, t- Ten months ago. It was, ter- and she knew what she was wow. doing, and she ruined the show for everyone. And the much of the rest of the audience didn't understand why I couldn't ignore it, mm-hmm. except for that live comedy. She was literally uh, whispering and saying she was in the front row center. She had paid extra for Mm -hmm. her birthday so that she could come fucking ruin the show. And she was whispering shit at me the whole for the whole time. And I was the only one who could hear it. And so I tried to explain that to the rest of the audience. They still walked like 40 people. Uh, But it was it was genuinely. I mean, those people carry guns. Mm-hmm. There's shootings in bars and restaurants and places all the time mm-hmm. where there were before we were all hunkered down and I was scared. And so I, it ended up and they were, they, I said, how long have you been a Nazi? And she said, I've always been one. And I said, and then I said, then I called her a cunt and then they got, I love then you. The, then the, then the people you. got mad at me and I said, well, then we're done cunt. We're done. I got nothing to say to you. If you are a a fascist, not if you identify as a white supremacist, you're insane. Exactly. And a fucking monster. Exactly. (laughs) She shouldn't have been seated where it wasn't a, it wasn't a rally. Yep. 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 There, she shouldn't have been seated with, I mean, someone wearing a Black Lives Matter hat, I wouldn't have cared because I know that it's part of an entire sentence. Black Lives Matter because uh, we say that because th- so obviously have not been uh, treated like that. That's exactly. that's the whole sentence. It's something like that. Anyway, so, but the, uh, but it's not, you know, it wasn't, it, w- it wasn't a political event. She right. was coming to a bar, no hat. You know, there's a lot of bars that won't let you wear Colors and hats and logos mm-hmm. and other bullshit. Mm-hmm. How about that? Mm-hmm. And and the and the, the 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 staff couldn't protect me. They didn't know what the fuck was going on. They were scared, and so they let me they let me just stand up there by myself. And um, it was genuinely I was afraid for my life. And then afterwards, they cornered me, and I had to I had to put my hands on the guy to push him away. Whoa. And as soon as I touched him, then the staff came and, and I was like, you were correct. I should not have placed a hand on him, but he was backing me into a corner. How many people, Jackie, how many people backing you? In the Just, corner? Uh, it was the woman. And then the guy who looked like Leonid Brezhnev. I don't know why I know what Leonid Brezhnev looks like. I don't know who that is. But... He, used to, uh, he used to be the uh, premier of the uh, Soviet Union uh, yeah. back in the 12th century. Anyway, a long time ago. But for some, you know, problem. Anyway, and, so, sorry, and they were doing this because you had made a political statement or you had said something that triggered. Well, that? Just, essentially, this woman either she was it was her birthday and she was a Trump supporter and she wanted to go fuck with somebody. And so she looked to see who was playing at the different comedy clubs. And my Twitter feed is just, hey, ICE, people who work at ICE, get a new job. That's a <laughs> shitty job. Yeah. I know you like raping children, but seriously, your grandchildren are going to deny your existence. Yeah. So anyway, but the, but it was, it was the, and the thing is, is it was so scary. And then I had five more shows that week. It was the second show of the week. And I was like, <laughs> At the same bar or different? At the same club. Same club. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you, uh, did you go and tell the staff or the manager to be like, hey, I was genuinely worried about for this, my safety. Like, did you? Oh, we, well, we talked about it the next day with the, with the manager. The manager that night was an, a very nice young man who's relatively new. Mm-hmm. If, the, if the general manager who was there the next night. Yeah. He yeah. had to, and he had to, and that poor bastard, we both had a bad day at work, Mona. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I had a terrifying day at work, and he had a bad day at work where the rest of the audience called in and said, she called that woman a cunt. She, it was not fun. It wasn't a fun show. And so he had to, like, refund people and do all And so I walked into the, and so when we first saw each other, the manager, who I don't know, and me, he, he said to me, sit down. In that tone of voice. And I said, oh, is, is this my fault? 
And so we both brought it up a notch. And then I said, why don't we bring it down a notch? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So I have learned some patience, uh-huh. you know, because I don't have a lot of back down, but I also have some empathy. I can figure out that he had a bad day too. Mm-hmm. And so we talked it out and I was like, what do you want to do? Do you want me to go home? Do you want me not to do this thing? The thing is, is if, if he said that uh, I had to go home, he had to pay me for the week. Right. And so he was hoping maybe that I would say I'm going to go home and then he wouldn't have to pay me for the week. But I'm like, oh, no, jackass. No. <laughs> I'm still saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. You still have to pay me. <laughs> pay me, bitch. That's right. So did you bring it down a few notches and did it work yeah. out? Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then we just sanely talked about what a terrible experience that was yeah. and how that let's not do that. And he was like, so tonight, and, and I was like, yeah, tonight mm-hmm. we're hoping I'm just going to do stand up comedy and yeah. the audience is going to watch that stand up comedy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, and so the rest of the week was fine. You know, Jackie, I think a lot of people who are not in the stand up comedy world think that heckling is comedy, but it is not fucking comedy. No, heckling, no, it's like heckling is like going to somebody's job, right? If somebody has a desk job and then going there and pouring coffee on their desk and like poking and just their knocking head. over their inbox, right, and over. you're like, eh, you right. didn't those papers, right? Let me just let me just <laughs> let me push over your computer. That's what heckling is to us, like we yeah. work years and years, hours upon hours to work out this material. We finally get you know booked uh, for a paid gig. We finally show up to do our job, and then some cunt would I have jokes to do there. I got you know what I got? I got if I got if I have forty five minutes, I'm telling you sixty minutes worth of jokes because you have the rest of your life to laugh at this shit. Yeah. I only have forty five minutes to talk to you, that's so right. that's yeah. Right. That's Speaking right. of which, we've been doing this for like two hours. How long are we hanging out? Oh, uh, we're we're almost done. We're going. Oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is fascinating. I thought it was an hour, and then as we hit, I was like, "No, I'm still, I'm still in. I'm still on board." <laughs> Well, I don't know if anyone's still listening. I hope you were having fun because I'm, I'm. I am really fun. having fun. Yeah, I I'm, would have mentioned 50 minutes ago. <laughs> I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, let's, let's see. We have like some comments here. It says, I remember when my brothers and friends came to a comedy concert. They came in a tux. Now that if the comics, now what if the comics start the heckling? Um, that's an okay. Interesting- yeah. Some people like to talk to the audience. Yes. And, the, and that is something like Ian Bag. Yeah, I love talking to talk the audience. Jimmy Pardo, you like to talk to Mona likes to talk to. I don't, I don't. I talk, I'm talking at you, uh, but I I can interact with the like I can interact with the audience. I just I would prefer it to be, you know, if I ask you a question, we could talk about it, yeah. and then and the thing is, is you should know this is that it's almost always going to be more clever if I've written it. I don't know if you've seen much improv. It can be bad. It can be yeah. super bad, you guys. You know what it is, so Jackie, but there are two kind of hecklings per se, right? If uh so you know, they tell you like, hey, only speak when spoken to, right? Only speak when spoken to. Right. I don't like to do a I don't like to heckle people per se where I'm demeaning them or making them feel bad. Listen, right. they didn't spend their hard earned money to come here, spend all this time, all this money to watch me to make them feel bad. That is not right. what this is about. Okay. Unless they come back at me with some curt comment or something, then I'm going to take it and run with it. But most of the time, it's very, uh, I keep it very lively, very positive, and very complimentary. Most of the time, that's how it goes. Yeah. So, I mean, but there are other comics who like to, pick on people and to make them feel bad. That's a different, that's a different kind of heckling per se, but I, that's not the kind of thing I like to do. I don't like right. that. And there's different kinds of heckling sort of in the way that it's just someone who doesn't realize how loud they are. Mm-hmm. Like if they're just sort of drunk and having a good time and they're like, yeah. did you hear her say that thing? And yeah. you're like, you're I'm, I'm right in front of you. I am. Uh, I too heard you say the thing that you heard me say the thing. <laughs> it's, this isn't television. We're right. This is a live thing. Yeah. And so that's, that's just interrupting the show, right? Yeah. Heckling. I, the, the first comedy show I ever saw, I heckled. Mm-hmm. It is an indictment against me that I have any hecklers ever. It isn't okay. <laughs> Sam Kinison. Uh, I saw Sam Kinison perform the first time, and I was drunk, 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 drunk. And there's nothing worse than a drunk woman heckler, unless you're a Nazi stone cold sober. Mm-hmm. Anyway, but um, the uh, but I was drunk, and he said something about being from Peoria, and I literally just yelled out, "I'm sorry." 
which was good timing, but fucked with his timing. And by the way, made him very angry. Uh, <laughs> it did. Yeah, because it isn't cool. It isn't, it's, you're just like, think of it as a, you're watching a play, right? Someone has written some jokes. Hopefully you will get them and you will think they're funny and it'll be that kind of, that's what it is. But like Lori will sometimes ask the audience. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why she's asking the audience. She's like, any of you guys got dogs? And they're like, they all have dogs, Lori. They all fucking have dogs. It's like where you are, the Jackie, if you're in LA, yes, a lot of people. But if you're in like New Brunswick, New Jersey, probably not. People don't have as many dogs. Don't, they don't they have as many have, dogs. They just have children. They don't have animals. <laughs> <laughs> hey, New Brunswick, get some dogs. They're great. We don't have a dog. I wish I had a dog. Pull it out and start getting some dogs. Is what I'm trying to get at people. Let's go. Condoms were invented in the 1700s. Right. That's what my, that's what my sister said to my dad once. Oh. And uh, and uh, and my dad, uh, somebody said, well, then you wouldn't have been born. And she's like, no, I would have been born a Rockefeller like I was supposed to have been. <laughs> exactly. Well said. Very well said. Um, I uh, absolutely uh, recently uh, love uh, what, um, I mean, loved and slash very saddened by uh, Lori's loss that she lost her mom to COVID. Uh, and that, was, COVID. that was so weird. Because she spent the last three years bitching about, and I will say this about her mother: she was a pill, but uh, I w- but she uh, didn't deserve to go like this, man. Nobody yeah. does. Yeah, yeah. Five days into just being in a rehab, so that she could learn to, uh, you know, get make her hip and knee work, um, and then she's yeah. dead. Yeah, yeah. Alone, you know. I think, but in very. Uh, uh, but in very uh, comedian fashion, she made it somehow all very funny. And I she mean, she's really- also brilliant at what she does. So she's very funny. <laughs> That's how she processes grief. Yeah. So, and, uh, hilariously. Darkly, yeah. darkly hilariously. Yes. She's but she a- too is full of rage. She's full of anger about this situation that sure. killed her mom. And she's full of sadness about her mom's life. Because the thing is, is and, it, and it's been really good actually, because her mom's, Old friends have sort of come forward and she's got to hear stories about when her mom wasn't made completely bananas by Fox news, you know, because, mm-hmm. because if there's, if there's, you know, yeah. she just shouldn't hear the dialogue. It, it's just a but, bunch of fingers, man. That's who I hate. I hate the button pushers. They're a bunch of fucking fingers. They should fuck off with this finger right there. <laughs> the middle one. Uh, Jackie, I know that you said you have two podcasts. One is the, the dork one. The Dork Forest, the Dork, the Dork Forest, Forest. Yeah. Uh, since 2006, and then the Jackie and Lori show since, I think, 2016. Wow. wow yeah. And uh, Jackie, uh, we're, we're going to wrap up. So you tell me, where can people find you? Well, I do uh, I do sort of Sunday services every week. I'm working on a new album. And so if you want to watch me work on uh, my favorite half hour that needs work, uh, I promise that some of it's already done. It's all very funny, uh, but I do a lot of, I do a lot of stand up online. You can go to Jackie You can go to at Jackie Cation for all the Instagram, Twitter, whatnot. And then the dork forest and the Jackie and Lori show is wherever you listen to podcasts. Wow. Amazing. 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 Uh, Jackie, this was, uh, this was a uh, Friday evening. Very well spent. It, yeah, it was, it was, it was really lovely talking to you. You're it great. Was- it was lovely. You're awesome, Jackie. Thank you so much. for I, I hope I can get Lori on the show, but I know that she's busy with stuff, but we'll see. Hopefully. I'll Who get knows? It. Who knows? Who knows? Right. right? It's, uh, yeah, I can't. It's, uh, <laughs> good luck. Well, I'll, thank you. I, I can give you your email address. <laughs> yes, please do. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here and having this conversation. This was uh, amazing. And just, just, I just had a great time. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Stay safe out there. Bye. Take care. Love you. Bye bye. Ah, oh, wasn't that amazing? It was so amazing. Oh, I love Jackie Cashin so much. She's so great. She just, she like revived me. I was feeling tired. And then I started talking to her and she's like caffeine to me. She's great. I love her. I love her stories. I love how she delivers them. She's an OG, man. Um, I hope you guys had a good time. I had a lovely time. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Definitely building up the channel more. So please do subscribe. Uh, this particular uh, episode is dedicated to a very, very loyal fan 
here who comes on and supports me in every single way. And this one is for my very, very awesome friend, James Harley. James, I hope I did not butcher your last name, but this episode is dedicated to you, my friend. So thank you for all your love and all your support since day one I started these. So thank you so much for everything. Uh, guys, have a lovely, lovely weekend. Have a um, you know great time. Wear your masks. Be safe out there. Uh, and I will see you guys on Monday at 6.15. Same time, same place. Love you guys. Have a great weekend. Good night.